Let's now cross live to Phyllis Penis. She's director of the Institute for Policy Studies. He's written extensively on the Middle East and the U.S. foreign policy. Joining us live from Washington, Phyllis, well, Obama, he's really under public pressure, and also his major allies, the U.K. and NATO, have turned down the prospect of any military intervention. Just how much did these factors impact on his decision to consult Congress? I think they played a major role. I think the fa he was prepared to go without a United Nations resolution, which of course would make any military strike illegal. But he was counting on certainly the Brits. He was counting on the UK to come on board. I think he was quite blindsided by that decision by the, the British Parliament. Uh, and then to find out that NATO said no and that the Arab League said no, France isn't quite enough as an international ally. I think all of that, plus the fact that almost 200 members of Congress uh, have signed letters in recent days demanding that there be some consultation with Congress, all of that pushed him to recognize that he could not just go ahead with this military strike and think he was going to retain public support for it. Public support is very, very low uh, for a military strike. More than half say explicitly they're against such a strike and the actual support is in the area of about 10 percent so it's really quite low okay so putting aside public support if he doesn't get that support from congress of course he could still go ahead couldn't he but will he listen to congress if, if it does say no intervention or do you think he could actually turn them down and just go ahead anyway well you know this is the big mystery the one question that was called out by one of the reporters as president obama finished his speech and walked back into the oval office back into the white house someone called out if congress says no will you get it, will you go ahead and he didn't answer that question not surprisingly perhaps i think that's the biggest question right now is whether he will feel bound by the congressional decision he made a point in his speech of saying i believe i have the right to go ahead regardless but I think that we are stronger when the President and Congress work together. So he was kind of leaving himself a fair amount of wiggle room to say, I might agree, I might not, if Congress disagrees. Right now, many of the people in Congress who have demanded a, a consultation role, who have demanded that the President uh, consult with them, probably support military uh, intervention. Some of Obama's strongest supporters would be people who would be against the war in other, in other contexts, but might be reluctant to come out against their chosen sitting president. So it's going to be a very complicated situation. He may face opposition to a military strike from the most extreme right wing of the Republicans and the Progressive Caucus uh, and the parts of the Black Caucus, perhaps, of the, uh, of the Democratic Party. But he may have support from mainstream Democrats, centrist Democrats, the leadership of both parties. In that situation, he may view that as sufficient, even though it would still be illegal because he doesn't have the crucial uh, authorization from the United Nations Security Council. Isn't anybody there in Congress thinking about the impact of what could happen if a military attack does take place? The retaliation threatened by Hezbollah, indeed Iran, highly rhetoric there, high rhetoric from Iran. I mean, this is, could be a major international impact, couldn't it? And, and it seems that Washington's not addressing the fallout from what could, could happen. I think that is a big concern, and I think the, the whole question of what happens the day after uh, is not on the agenda sufficiently of members of Congress. I think people are not looking at what happens beyond the claim of President Obama and Vice President Biden about our intentions. We can say all we want. Our intention is a narrow, targeted strike, just a day or two. This is not a major, uh, a major military campaign. Well, it's not a major military campaign until it is, meaning that if, for example, Syria decides to retaliate to what it would legitimately view as an act of war within this broader civil war, what if, of course, Syria tries to retaliate against one of the U.S. warships that are off the Syrian coast? What if it tries to shoot down a U.S. plane? What if it retaliates against Israel? What if it attacks a U.S. base in one of the neighboring countries? All of these things would be then met by greater U.S. retaliation to that act. We can't assume that the U.S. would take the position, we didn't intend this to be more than a couple days, we're not going to respond. They would certainly respond, and that threatens the whole possibility of the United States being pulled directly into this very complicated civil war inside Syria, 
a war that is already five separate wars that are underway, only one of which is the civil war. We also already have a regional war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We have a sectarian war between Sunni and Shia. We have a, a war so far of words between the U.S. and Russia. We have a war between Iran and the U.S. and Israel. All of these wars are being fought to the last Syrian. So whatever happens, it's going to be the people of Syria who pay the final price. Phyllis Benes, thanks so much. Great to hear your thoughts on this. Phyllis Benes, director of uh, the P Institute for Policy Studies live in Washington.